I literally didn't know what it was. There was a time when I just we wasn't sure what it was. And this, this must have been in like 2007 or so, approximately around then. And yeah, starting that, it's of course not many people were doing that at the time, so I think the timing was, was good. And I did that, and of course people do the typical thing that happens with composers. They email you and they say, I heard your piece, I like your piece, can I play your piece? And that basically grew into a traditional self-publishing business and that's what my wife and I do and it was a very slow growth and the story I usually tell is about the slow growth. I run into a lot of folks who say I want to self-publish or I want to maybe go to a, a official publisher and I've got this couple of pieces and what should I do and they maybe like try one thing and it doesn't work they give it a, a six months and it doesn't take off and stop and so the, the the story I seem to tell over and over is that like the slow, slow burn, is that what they the slow growth and just being very patient and uh, doing it step by step and you don't need to order a thousand copies of your book if no one's asking for one. <laughs> but, but really like people like do that, they, they do the wrong, they do the steps in the wrong order. So I, I think the internet's really useful because you do some work and then the work keeps working for you when you're done with it. And then, uh, yeah, I mean, so of course we still do that. And then nowadays we've started this podcast called At Percussion. And we're, we just released our 120th episode about. And yeah, that's been really fun. And uh, we don't make a cent doing it. In fact, we spend too much money doing it. But <laughs> it's, uh, it's really satisfying. And 
That is a great podcast. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Is it only on YouTube or can you do iTunes? It's on iTunes. It's on YouTube. We have a uh, archive on a an at percussion blogspot page, and that's about it. It, sh it should be in the other regular podcast catchers. Yeah, we should probably need more to that. That's not exactly sure. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for mentioning that. <laughs> My pleasure. Thing? Shall we? Yeah. <laughs> All right. um, yeah, my name is Drew Tucker, and um, it's not a xylophone. It is not a xylophone. This is Drew Tucker. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. So my, my my website is it's not a xylophone .com. My Instagram is it's not a xylophone. My Twitter because it was it's not a xylophone. Too many letters. There's no e, so it's not a xylo. Um, I think someone came up with that recently in this room somewhere. I don't remember. Anyhow, it's not a xylo, uh, and facebook.com slash it's not a xylo. I'm surprised no one picked up on any of those after the first one, but they were all available. So, um, you know, but, and I, I think I'm in a unique situation than the uh, distinguished gentleman beside, maybe except for maybe Adam, in that I don't, I don't kind of have like the kind of standard career. So, no, no, you're distinguished. You're distinguished. No, no, hold on. So, can someone let me tweet this instead? Um, no, so I'm different from most of these distinguished gentlemen in the fact that I don't have kind of the standard career. I didn't kind of go the standard path to get to said career. Um, I, I pretty much got out of school and, and I really got to work. And what happened was I really got into volunteerism even while I was in college. And as a result, it, it led me down a lot of different pathways that I didn't see were available. Um, and in that work and all of the things that I was doing, I knew I never really wanted to teach institutional in an institutional setting. Um, and I knew that I didn't want to play for an orchestra. Uh, you know, as a percussionist, it never jazzed me ever. And um, I, I have a high amount of respect for those that it doesn't. Um, but for me, it wasn't it, you know, and I, and I love jazz and I play the vibraphone. And, he, and the big thing for me is that no one calls vibraphone players, like zero people. I think in the, my entire career, I think maybe on this hand, I can say how many people have called. So it was like, okay, how do we, how do we hustle? So from day one, it's been a hustle. You know, I, I play drum set, like I'm, I'm, I'm slightly above mediocre at a drum set. I'm slightly below mediocre at any sort of rudimental snare drum or anything like that. So the question that I just kind of had, and, you know, and I love photography, and so when Instagram came out, maybe like, not came out, but when I found out about it, maybe six years ago now, you know, I got on it, and it was just a really cool way to tell a story. And I feel like a, that has been kind of the theme, Instagram-wise, that I've really tried, been trying to do, is just really tell my story in this whole entire thing. And, you know, my screen name has gone from Drew, Drew Tucker, Drew underscore Tucker, underscore Drew, slash Tucker. And then one day I'm playing these gigs, man, and I mean, when I tell you, it was like a train of people who were probably paid to come try to annoy me, who just came in and were like, dude, love the xylophone. Love the xylophone, <laughs> Love it, can't wait to see the xylophone again. Dude, can you play? This thing? You're gonna have the four sticks on the xylophone, man. I mean, just like, I mean, like it was relentless, man. And so I was like, God, it's just, it's not, and usually I let it go, you know, because I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to get home and do my thing, but at this moment, I was just like, no, man, it's just, it's not a xylophone. I just, it's not. And then it, it same night, I kid you not, it was like someone commented on my post, dude, love the xylophone. When are you doing your next xylophone concert? And I'm just like, I wonder if this fits. And it, Instagram accepted. And I was like, cool, done. I never thought about it again until I was somewhere else. I'm like, hey, it's not a xylophone. And I was like, you're right. It's not. <laughs> and, 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 and it seems somewhat counterintuitive because some people will actually call it a xylophone because they think about it, like people who aren't percussionists. Oh, you play this. Wait, wait, it's not as. What is it? And oh, yes, thank God. Like, I can have conversations and educate people. And so, um, and so with Instagram, it's been a great way for me to tell a story. And one of the other reasons why I really do. Oh, I mean, we'll get into like the nuts and bolts of the whole thing, you know, as we go forward. But it's been a great way for me to. Um, create lots of real relationships. And I feel like without the, without the noise of Facebook for me, you know what I mean, without all of the kind of other things that kind of go into Facebook, you know, it, it's been a way for me to act in a way, I don't know how to even say this, but to put the human element, it feels more human to me, Instagram does, than does a lot of other things where there's so many attachments and links and things that you can kind of push forward. So it's really been effective, 
you know, for me in terms of connecting with people, like there are people in this room, a lot of people, most of the people I know in this room, including the ones down here, and that's probably the way that I met them, but you know, it feels like I've known them forever, even though that sounds so millennial to say. <laughs> uh, but that, yeah, that's, that's, that's the deal. So that's my, that, that is my favorite platform, I would have to say, and everything kind of spreads from, from here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, so uh, I think, uh, I don't know. <laughs> also a YouTuber. That's right. YouTube, yeah. Yeah. YouTube That's right. So I feel like I'm, if, if there's a dinosaur on the panel, that it's probably me. Um, I don't know everybody's age, but I, I think I'm the oldest. I'm 68. How old are you? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I turned 40 um, this year, in March. Does that make me the oldest? Thirty-five. So we're cool. <laughs> Thanks, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> five, five I, pull, I see pull. forty from where I'm at. Okay. All right. Um, How old are you? Yeah. Around twelve. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm I'm definitely the oldest, and I'm definitely I think um, if my if my duo partner Doug were here, he he would uh, second this. I'm the least likely person to be using technology as a means. In any way whatsoever. So uh, I had always stayed away from that. I mean, you know, as a player, I was just I, I just wanted to play. I didn't want to mess with. You know, I stayed away from electroacoustic pieces, things that, that involved plugging in. I just didn't do that. Um, and so uh, being in this position now and having um, this particular platform um, and sitting up here with these guys. Uh, feels kind of funny to me because um, it's not it's not what I've been about for so long um, but it has become something that I very much am about especially over the last two or three years um, and I think that's hopefully I mean as I look around the room I said I'm the oldest person on the panel I think maybe I'm the, the oldest person in the room <laughs> no <laughs> all right <laughs> thank you <laughs> um, you know, this this is something um, that has been, I think, in terms of my career. So I started teaching at Baylor in 2003. Um, I uh, was an original founding member of So Percussion in 1999. Um, Doug and I started a duo project, the Me and Perkins duo, in 06. Um, and all of those things, and, and I had a stint where I um, uh, was you know, desperately in love with the idea of playing in an orchestra. It was before Audition Hacker, so I didn't have the tools I needed <laughs> 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 to, be, to be successful. Uh, so you know, I had to abandon that. But you know, I've, I've made a career both in teaching and specifically in contemporary chamber music. Um, and none of that, even though all of that has been so unbelievably uh, fulfilling and um, uh, artistically fulfilling, um, none of that has really come close to the types of things I've been able to do over the past two years with um, Liquid Drum in terms of reach, in terms of like getting things out to people, uh, in terms of coming to KSIC and being able to talk to people uh, that I don't know and have never met, but can, but can have a conversation over something that you know that we've both experienced uh, through the internet, um, and so that for me is is huge. I think we're all doing this for different reasons. I think at at, at the core, of course, we we are all very much interested in whatever the creative output is that we are putting out there. Um, but for me, especially as as a uh, forty year old guy who. I'm in a period of life where I probably um, am, am, am wanting to spend like more time at home and go to my kids' football games. Um, this, as as a vehicle and as a thing, is necessary. It's like a it's a lifeline, and it's something that um, is enabling me to do things that I thought maybe I wasn't going to be able to do at this point in my career, um, knowing that I didn't want to run around you know the country and the world. Forever, um, I did that for for a time, 
Um, but this is a different time. But I'm still able to use this now, oddly, to reach more people. Um, and so I'm still learning. Uh, you know, I learn by, by watching the stuff that these guys put out and, and others of you in the room who are, who are putting out really great content. Um, I am by no means uh, uh, someone who has it all figured out. I mean, every, every single day when I, when I open up my phone, I see something else. It's like, man, so-and-so is doing this thing. I should, I, you know, uh, I feel behind. I feel like I need to, you know, do whatever that thing is to catch up. So I'm, I'm very much a student of this, um, and I'm very much, um, I'm, I'm certainly not as much a native of it uh, as, as some of you are in the room. Um, but I love it, and, and it's become, for me, something that's just absolutely crucial uh, to my professional life. Um, so, super happy to be here. Sorry, I hit you. Or like, touching your knee like a lot. But really, just to, to get to discuss these things uh, with this group of people and with all of you. Um, now it's turned into like a punk band now. It is. Yeah. 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 We anticipate your speech. <laughs> we should really uh, get that door closed in the back there, if at all possible. If, if you guys want to filter in and feel free to. Oh, hey, let's um, yeah, there's a yeah. three by three oh, foot square right here. Yeah, there's a few more. You could probably fit 20 people. You could probably pull back a little bit too. Yeah, yeah. Back. yeah. That's I mean, you have to get claustrophobic or just go up right. Right there, I think they're here. Yeah. That's good. in the progression and I I finally like figured out how to make a career in percussion and I was waiting I was like okay this audition thing I figured it out boom I did it so I'm assuming now all of these schools or people out there who are also trying to do that and to find their way in will come and ask me how to do it because like I just figured it out like last week so like, doesn't that make sense that I would just like tell them what's going on right now and what the steps are? But then I waited and I waited and I was like, what's going on here? Like, I don't get this. I don't get it. Why? Why aren't? Why don't we as percussionists have like constant coaching? You know the way that that baseball players do. Every time you go to a practice in a baseball team, a professional baseball team, you have like a team of coaches who have all been spending the night watching videos of you so that they can give you 
better ideas for your swing the next day. Like, like constant coaching. And so I, so I said, okay, nobody's gonna hire me to teach. And all these kids out there who are from, I'm meeting them today, finally, you know, Oklahoma, Alabama. Uh, I met somebody from South Dakota. Um, many places that I've never been. And I, they're just not on the way to anywhere. And they're, <laughs> no. <laughs> that's why, that's why. Like, that I felt even though Michigan is, you know, I was near Detroit and near an airport and a big orchestra, I felt secluded, you know? So I like, I said, okay, you know what? I'm gonna take this into my own hands and work on making things to help the people who are sitting at home in their practice room and they don't know what to do next. Yeah, that's, that's about it. So, so yeah. There we go. yeah, and it's like, it doesn't matter if it's blogs or videos or YouTube, wherever you guys go, I'll go there too and try to figure out what to do. And sometimes it'll be dumb, but as long as I have <laughs> Adam helping me and uh, as long as there are inspiring other people, you know, making interesting things. Can I add something? Yeah. About Rob. So on our podcast, we have Rob, and you know, often our guests have a comment that really stays with me. And one of Rob's was I was asking him something he was just explaining, which is like, why did you start all this online activity that you're so good at and so active at? And I don't know if you remember this. Please correct me if I'm if I'm wrong, but. He said, you do all this work to get the job, and you work, and you work, and you work, and then you get the job, and like, now all that work is, it's like, it's it's just left in the Stops. air, and it's still, yeah, all that work suddenly stops. It's like, where do you put your energy, and what do you do with all of that, that you, you've been, of course, you go do the job, and play the job, but it's not the same kind of work, and that's, that's I think that's really cool, that's, that stuck with me. And also the thing about, oh, I just did all this work and I won the job. Why aren't all these universities calling me for clinics and gigs all the time? Like, Rob's not the first symphonic player I've talked to that's told me that exact same thing. Yeah. I, I run into them often and I say, so you must be really busy. And they're like, principal of the major symphony orchestra. And they say, like, no, I don't really get called to do stuff. Yeah. It's like, that's surprising. That is really surprising. Yeah. Well, and the reason is because the you know, we have this very established, you know, somewhat successful uh, education industry. It's entrenched. It's, you, you know, we have to set up our real jobs in the world in order to have a full career out of it. So, um, you know, that's why it's unusual for a symphonic player who has a, uh, you know, a lot of maybe interesting things to say to not just like immediately scoot in. But that's why there's room in the online world. And I think what's really interesting about this group, like look at this group, this is a very satisfyingly varied group of percussionists. You know, I would say we're all, we all have different focuses. We're all working in different areas of percussion. In a way, we're all sort of like the first ones who's, who's ever done any of those you know, things in our little tiny area. And you know, I don't know if are you, are people out there thinking about one day what kind of online work they want to do, what kind of performing online. I know they are very <laughs> composing or videos or helping students education wise. You know, think about all of the things that could be talked about online. Think about all the ways that you guys wish that there were things for you right now. Those are the things which when, you know, if maybe you know, maybe you're a master at the, you know, Doombeck with, uh, foot. Doombeck with foot jingles. pedal, um, <laughs> jing and jingles in a, in a country western band. <laughs> that's it. Maybe that is your niche, like little area of expertise and like nobody else has that. But you Someone can, in here is like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like, yeah, there are so many wide open voids of the online world for you guys all who are right here, who are, we're sort of at the forefront of this 
like us meaning us and you guys, everyone here, we're all at the forefront of this kind of like explosion online. And I, I think it's, you know, if I want, if I could ask you guys to take one thing home today, it'd be, you know, how am I going to use online to help other people or to, to be artistic in? And yeah, cool. All right. Adam Tan, ladies and gentlemen. Serious though, how old are you? Um, never mind. You know what? You want to change that? Yeah, it's not on his brand. It's not on brand. Twenty something. You have a fake idea for later. Okay. Twenty something. Sure. All right. Um, I have a very different story to these four guys next to me because I'm obviously the least experienced of them. These guys are like at the top of their respective games, and I have. Probably the least amount of performing experience. I don't teach at a university. I'm not in a major orchestra. I don't have a good stoic face. I can't do it. It's not possible. <laughs> <laughs> so I do, I do a good what? A stoic face. Like, okay, my stoic face. Oh. oh. <laughs> 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 it's it's got chills. <laughs> I don't have any of those things, right? But I just want to tell you a little bit about my story of why I end up sitting here on this table of people who are completely much better than me, way more well known than me. And it starts off with... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, but um, how many people in this room have a YouTube channel? Oh, that's good. That's good. How many people regularly upload to their YouTube channel? At least, at least once a week. Oh. <laughs> once every two weeks. <laughs> once every month. <laughs> okay, so nowadays YouTube, everyone sort of has, you saw that, everyone has a YouTube channel. But I started making videos when I was in six year of primary school, so I was about 10 years old. And while everyone else was playing, you know, piano, violin, serious instruments, I was playing with old cameras. And I was in this class called Movie Making, where they were teaching how to make videos in Windows XP. And we made some really sucky like vampire movies where we pretend to roll it before, like, oh, I'm oh, dead, oh, and then and then that, like you just edit that one clip and it'd be like the end. And that's that's your that's your HD for the year, right? So I did I did that for a while. That's how I got interested in this whole idea of video editing because speaking and like audio only things, I know they're still popular. Like podcasts are really popular still because you know it's kind of like a radio show or whatever. But videos to me have been always to me, the, the pinnacle of expression, because you can change the pace, you can change the articulation just by all these different methods of the visual medium. So I was really intrigued with this. I would put, I'd make really stupid videos with like pictures I stole off Google Images or like Colonel Sanders or whatever. <laughs> You'd be like, my name is Jeff. Or something. Yeah. <laughs> like, so, it'd be so dumb. Like it's the dumbest things ever. But I really got intrigued with that. And so I've been making YouTube videos for the good part of about 10 years. But of those 10 years, only two of those years were like serious videos. And what that taught me was that you can make anything happen with YouTube. <laughs> you can make anything happen. And the reason why my, my show is like, like some of you guys might watch my show maybe, is because I used all those ideas from many years ago to make these videos, right? But back then, there was no Facebook, there was no Instagram, YouTube was like this little square of uh, like a cat video or something, right? And it was just, there's like nothing there. But people like Casey made videos anyway because we all had the same motive, which was to share our work. But nowadays I think YouTube is not, no longer just about sharing for ourselves, right? Because it's all interlinked with the idea of social media. You've got Facebook, you know, how many people use Facebook? Like everyone, everyone uses Facebook. How many people upload something to Facebook every day? How many? Okay, that's slightly better than the YouTube channel. <laughs> what about Instagram? How many people have an Instagram account? How many people use Instagram stories? How many people use Snapchat stories? Ah, uh, Americans, okay. <laughs> See, we all have smartphones now, and everyone is able to access information at the click of a finger, right? And a lot of people always ask me, because I'm always pushing this whole post videos of yourself, post videos of yourself playing, post videos of yourself talking about something you found in the mail, like someone sends you mails or gives you like a pair of mails, be like, oh yeah, I like this, and then you just make a video of that. And people are like, and why should I make videos if I'm not interested in making videos as a profession? Or if I'm not interested in becoming <coughs> famous or whatever, I'm not interested in being well known. Why should I make videos? And the answer is because you should contribute to the community. 
okay? People are like me, like I come from Perth, Western Australia, just like Rob's Michigan story, except I'm still in Perth, Western Australia, <laughs> okay? Perth is a city on the west coast of Australia, which is approximately 23 hours from here by plane. It's very far, far away, it's a completely different time zone, that's why me and Rob have to have Skype calls at alternating times, so it'll be morning for me and he'll be drinking Spanish wine in his apartment. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the power of the internet, right? It's like, I live so far away, but I can access all these new things, all these new things that I've never heard of before. And I was only exposed to this like last year. That was my first time to America. I went to Chosen Mail, and you know, I met a few of these really cool people. And like, it was so different for me, because in Australia, our percussion scene isn't as big as it is here, obviously. Like, we're in basic right now. It's not even close. And how do you, how do you share that with people? How do, you, how do you get that out to more people? How many of you guys have learned a piece on a percussion instrument, whether it's like rimba, multi-solo, or whatever, based on a video that you saw on my cavity. Right? Right? Okay, so the idea of things like repertoire lists, I know they're all important, but nothing gives you the sensation of knowing what something is like better than the video. That's the closest thing you'll get to seeing it live. Okay? So that is why you should post videos. It's because you should contribute to the repertoire. Right? For example, how many times have you searched for a video of a piece? They're like a famous one, like Khan Variation stuff, right? And there's only about three decent renditions. The rest are filmed with potatoes, right? They're like <laughs> completely pixelated, the audio sounds like <gasps> it's terrible. It's terrible, right? It's and, and we all think that's like, then it's, it's funny now, right? You think about it, but that's, that's kind of sad, right? How many times do you go online and you search for a cover of a famous pop song like Bruno Mars or something, and there are Nice HD covers, it's like a glamorous girl with like a like this, and she's obviously lip syncing, but no one cares because she's a girl, she's like a nice hair, whatever. But like, you know, that's, that's clickbait for you, right, ladies and gentlemen. But really, what I'm trying to say is we don't push promoting our pieces enough at the moment, right? We are not in the same league as a lot of violin people. I know there's a lot of violin people, two set violin, anyone heard of two set violin? Right? People like that, they're really pushing classical instruments on modern mediums like YouTube. And percussion is one of the most like, it's one of the most modern instruments. Like well, marimba for example, only really existed for the last half half century or so. Like that's only when it really started getting serious. And we really should be pushing it more. There should be so many renditions of the one piece by different people around the world. So you can get different ideas of different interpretations, different ideas. And there's not enough because we're all too scared, right? We're like what if, what if they say bad things about me? What if they say that I, I, my playing sucks? Or what, what if, like, I don't know, what if Pius Chen comments on my video and says, Casey sucks, or something like that? <laughs> 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 Pius is meant to be here, but he has to, he has to judge something. So Actually, Pius is covering for Yeah, he's covering right for him. So we can't see the beef live, unfortunately. <laughs> um, otherwise, it would be like McGregor and uh, Mayweather. Yeah. But, but yeah, what I'm trying to say is, don't be afraid to post yourself online, okay? Because I did that, I took, I took a leap of faith last year, bought my marimba, filmed an episode about a marimba, an episode. And people were like, you're crazy Adam, a show about percussion, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard, like who's gonna watch that? And they were right, nobody watched my show for the first three months, nobody watched my show. I had like 10 subscribers, one of them was me, one of them was my brother, one of them was my brother. Two of them were my friends, and the rest were probably like spam bots or something. <laughs> I was getting less than 100 views a video, and that's, you know, that's disheartening, right? But at the same time, you shouldn't be thinking about views, or likes, subscribe, those things are just numbers. What's important is that you're contributing in some way. That is, that is why we all play in the first place, right? It's because you want, you want to share your craft with people. It shouldn't matter about how many numbers you get, it shouldn't matter about you know, how many uh, rub up memes on your video. What really matters is you are sharing. So I really wanted to push the idea of sharing today, which is why we have this panel of people who share their craft through video to people who may not be able to access it as easily as people who get to go to like nice schools and have like the repertoire laid out in front of them like this. Oh, here's our repertoire list. This is canon in, in this in this part of the country, and they should show that like, what's that? Right? Like they don't know. We we I only learned a lot of stuff today from just being here. I, just, I, I learned so much in one day, and for a lot of you guys, that's not right. Think about that. So we really need to like post more videos, and I encourage everyone to just get your phone. That's another thing that I always say to people is they always say. Oh, I don't own like one of these. I don't own one of these Casey Neistat vlogging camera originals. <laughs> oh, I don't own a GH4. I don't own a Red Dragon like 4K cinematic camera. No, it doesn't matter. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> right. What are these mallets? What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> you know, cameras? Pretty, pretty decent. Cameras? Right? 
Yeah, the camera's right. back. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, camera's like, but that's the point, right? It's like, back now. Okay. Yeah, like, <laughs> Casey films his videos in like a very nice square aspect ratio thing that could potentially look like a potato, but it doesn't, right? This, like, he films like, his first videos were very low quality. If you guys have seen his white knuckle straw video, that is like, it's, 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 Back then, you know, we, we didn't have like fancy iPhone cameras or whatever, right? But nowadays, everyone has a smartphone, everyone has a camera. Just film, just record yourself playing stuff and just put it online and let people see so that people know that production is like a serious thing. It's not just something you do because you can't find a job. <laughs> I get that all the time. Like, and what do you work to this? Ha ha, enjoy Mackers. Like, enjoy working at McDonald's. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. So, <laughs> that's, that's, yeah, we call it that because I don't know. Mickey D's. That's, that's, that's what I want to but, but, but I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna piggyback off something that you just said and that, that he said earlier. He talked about, you know, everyone can give in to, to this, to, to be online, to, to contribute. And there's a space for everyone. And I think that that space Everyone up here is unapologetically themselves. Like, everything about what you just heard was Adam Tan. <laughs> there was no Adam saying, uh-oh, I'm here, let me adjust X, Y, and Z, and be something different. Everything about, like, I, I honestly fell in love with this guy right here. <laughs> fell in love with him because I saw that Moves for Marimba video. How many of you guys have seen that Moves for Marimba? <laughs> Dude, I don't have a student who walks in, I'm like, okay, first lesson. You know what I mean? So, so we can have this. We can talk on the same level now. You know what I mean? Like, all right. So we're going to. Uh, it's the infantismo. We're not there yet. Let's slow down. Um, gut punch is only head bob. I mean, I, I can quote the whole thing. And I, I, my comment to him, I found him and I said, as soon as I see you at Pesach, I'm buying you a beer. And that was in San Antonio two years ago. And I said, Todd Meehan, and I handed the cat a beer. You know what I mean? Because like that, that was him. Like you don't make that up. Like that is him. He actually does those things, every performance. Um, but I, I feel like, you know, just to get back to that point when he was bringing it up, there's space for everyone if you're sincere about what you are bringing. So when he, when he brought up the fact about, hey, if you're a, what did you say, a cajon playing jingle? To do country back, Western. All that with Country Western. Dude, do that thing. I, I don't play jazz very much on the vibraphone, like in terms of the spang, spang-a-lang, spang-a-lang, spang-a-lang. Like I don't play much of it. Because I love, I love hip-hop. I love Dilla. I came up on Tribe Called Quest. I came up, so I really kind of only play those tunes. Or tunes that are similar to it or inspired by it. Not because I don't appreciate or respect it, but because that's what makes me tick. Like it, I light up on stage when I get to do that. You know, when we get to play those tunes or reference those tunes, if I were to go and say, hey, I'm going to start playing all jazz and all strings. I, by the way, I practice tons of jazz, as much as I can, because of vocab and you know, all these other kind of things. But when I perform and I'm developing things, I'm developing things that make me want to share. Like, I can't wait. I cannot wait to share the thing that I'm doing with you, because it excites me, and I want you to be excited, too. And so those are the things that I'm trying to, to share. I love drum corps. I love Marching pits. I hate a lot of the approaches of all of those marching pits <laughs> and drum boards. I think they ruin all of your touch. And that's another discussion, another bar. Yeah. Catch me at the bar, though. <laughs> <laughs> More than happy to have you. Um, but, 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 but really, all of that influences my playing. If you watch, there's stuff that I would write for my front ensemble or have written in that key that I will throw into things that I play. And that's just me. You know what I mean? I, if I try to do the other thing, or try to be Gary, or try to be Stefan, or try to be those guys with their experience and their things, I, I will fail. I will 100% fail and no one will follow. You know, and so I figure like when he's saying that, you know, just to wrap that up, um, I feel like there are a people that will love you when you are you. It's just like they do in real life. Like if you are you, unapologetically yourself, you know, um, curated with a filter, obviously. Um, and, and, and you do that, people will love you. And, and conversely, there are a whole bunch of people who really won't, but you sift through it really fast. And then you, you learn what the people who love you really love, and you keep giving them that. The people who find value in the content that you're bringing, and you continue to, per, you know, put that out into the world. Instead of trying to hit this wide net, oh no, so-and-so doesn't like it, well you know what? So-and-so likes XYZ type of music and XYZ approach, and there are people for that too. And that's what's beautiful about the whole thing. We can contribute as long as, and so sometimes you have to find that thing first. You know what I mean? You, you know, and sometimes you do a trial and error, and, and that's cool too.
maybe we should take some questions. Yes. Who, who has questions? Uh, they can be directed at the general us or to somebody specific. Um, so you've heard a little bit about each of us. Maybe you didn't know all of us at first. Uh, does anybody have any questions? I want to know what you guys are thinking about. Yeah. Adam, you mentioned the importance of creating consistent content. Where would you start and how do you evaluate when it's time to change the course of what you're putting out there or reevaluate or criticize, et cetera? That's a good question. Um, consistent content is actually a really big deal. Like, consistency can be defined in many ways. Some people define it as once a month, or once a year, once a week, every day. But the important thing is that you, you have to understand, I guess, what you're doing it for, first of all. So, for example, I make videos once a week, right? because I think once a week is a good window of time to produce a decent quality episode, while keeping the longevity of the show going. So, like, if I did one every single day, it's just not possible. Uh, I would die from the editing, I would die from the die. But if I did one every week and it's and it all has like the same level of quality, I feel like that is good. The time that I feel like maybe it needs to evolve is if the show is reaching a point like whatever I'm making, or if it's not a show, whatever. Like if whatever I'm making is not satisfying me anymore, maybe I have to make it less even, like maybe even bigger spaces in between. Because ultimately the most important thing is that you keep uploading, but it has to stay good. Okay, like a lot of people, like, I always use Instagram as an example. How many times have you gone on an Instagram profile and there's a person who posts a photo every two hours, three hours, and it'll be like one of their hand, one of their face, and have some, some, some lame hashtag on it. But, like, it's too much. Too much is not good. Like, just because you have lots of content doesn't mean it's good. I thought you said you were going to talk about it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yours is the exception. And your face is very nice. Um, <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is, like, yeah, you should aim to make content as much as possible, okay? Like, literally just post as much as you feel comfortable with, but don't push yourself to do too much, because I used to upload blogs every single day, like on my blog channel. Before I started the studio, I uploaded blogs every single day. I would go and edit the videos at like 4 a.m. at night, you know? and then I'd wake up the next morning, upload, and be like, is it really worth getting 20 views for that video? <laughs> like, is it really worth it? And like, I know it's, it's not about numbers, but I also didn't feel personally satisfied. I felt like I was just doing it for the sake of it. But when I'm releasing these videos once a week and I know the intent is clear behind it, then that's a good amount. Now, if I felt like I wasn't challenging myself, to do it, I felt like the videos were really easy, it took me a short time and I produced them in like five minutes and they came out once a week and it's like, mm, maybe I can do twice a week. Okay, But if I'm doing them once a week and the quality is not good enough and it's taking a long time and it's because I'm getting tired, then maybe twice a week. But the important thing is that it's still going. And you should never feel bad about, at the same time, you should never feel bad about taking a break. Like some people are always like, oh, you, you stop making videos for three, four weeks, what happened? And I've done that sometimes, I'm guilty of that because sometimes things happen in life, you know? Like sometimes you're not, you're not feeling in the right mindset to make a video. And the last thing you want to do is force this false version. Just like Drew was saying, you don't want to force a false version of yourself to your audience because they're just gonna, they can, they can see right through that. Like anyone can see right through that. So quality over quantity, don't push yourself too much. And yeah, consistency is good, but just don't, don't be like, oh, I must post every single day. Can I, can I add? Yeah, go. Ahead. So, uh, something Adam's really good at, obviously, is the production quality of his videos. And as someone who edits their own videos, I know how hard that is. That's, and I know every trick he does, like, I know how to do it. So, I really have an idea of how long that would take me. So, back to, <laughs> back to sort of what we said at the beginning about constantly driving, like I talked about Rob's drive and how that drive continued after he won his audition and now he has this whole other thing. Um, yeah, like you can't, or I wouldn't advise like with saying, oh, I didn't get any likes, I didn't get any subscribers, I've been doing this for a whole month. Yeah, it's gonna take a lot longer than that and you need your, your drive has to just fuel it, you have to wanna do it. Anyway, I actually just looked up the name of the person because I wanted to say it right, there's some research we reported on a Harvard business, business professor named Tomas Camaro pre-music, ironically pre-music is his last name, but he talks about this research of confidence over competence, and it's really interesting for a lot of reasons, but the part I want to tell you guys is the, comp the uh, confidence part. He talks about people who are really good at anything, uh, athletes, businessmen, artists, they have that relentless drive and they describe those people as, you know, the same thing, the same thoughts that keep you awake at night are the same things that get you up in the morning. And 
know, if you're excited to get up and do your thing, that's a good thing. That's a really good thing. Of course, that could just be like practicing your instrument. Hopefully, it's that for all of us. And, and then the one other thing I would say is what Adam's saying, it, it's very hard. It's hard to get good at whatever that thing is, but it does get better. You do get better at it. And I know when I was started editing our podcast, it was taking me literally six hours an episode, which is pathetic for what it is. Like, that's just pitiful. And it's gotten easier. So it gets easier to be more consistent, but you have to be patient enough to write it out when it's, uh, you know, accumulating popularity. Can I just give one quick counterpoint to all of this about consistency and slow growth? The other option is just to think of something super epic to do and just do it all at once. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, I feel like the best things I've done have come right after long, guilty breaks. Like, ah, oh, I haven't done anything for three and a half months. You slowly get your motivation back, and then you start to think, like, you know what's not out there right now? This is like the idea I had about the Della Clues thing. I said, there's no Della Clues recordings out there. So instead of putting out one thing a week, I was like reading about blogging and you know trying to understand what it would take to make a website. But I said, okay, why don't I just practice something epically? That's different. It's like writing a symphony. That's true. You know, yeah. That's a huge project. And now that you've done that project, you've created content, you could, if you wanted to, do what Adam was saying, do like consistent that's right. posts or whatever. That's right. So it's not like composer, man, I'm gonna write like a damn symphony every week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. No, 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 I, I agree. Yeah, I was just providing a little counterpoint, you know, to, to this idea. But uh, anyway, let's move on. <laughs> she has a question. Yes. So with quality, consistent, consistent quality content, how do you sort of bring that all under your personal mission? Because obviously, like everyone, well, I don't even come up with your personal mission, right? Everyone has one. If you're putting out content, you want like a message you're trying to get across, or like a way you're trying to connect with someone. So, like, how did each of you like figure out your personal mission, and then how do you go about like making sure everything falls under that? Yeah, like the kung fu guy you haven't spoken yet. I feel like you're all about personal Yeah. Yeah. Really? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, and other I things. That, like, and tambourine and triangle. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's kind of interesting because I, I um, um, well, one, I will say this too, to, to um, reference another part of my life, and that is um, my duo and playing with Doug. Um, Doug talks a lot. I don't know if you guys know Doug, but he's a talker. Um, I know. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so whenever we do master classes or something, this is what I do. I just sit here, and he does all the talk. And then at some point at the end, I'll say like five things. You know, um, I'm happy to fill that role here. But also thank you for pointing at me. Um, <laughs> Doug never never does that. <laughs> um, yeah. So mission. I don't know, like my, my thing, the liquid drum thing um, has been, I think, hard to explain uh, to other people at times. Um, I, at least initially before I had, like, so I wrote the Stanbury Triangle book, before I had that, before I had, like, product, um, I, you know, people would ask, like, well, what do you do? What is this? What are you doing? Like, do you just not want to put do you not want to have a Todd Meehan Instagram account? Do you just want to have Liquid Drum? Sorry, I'm, I'm awful. Damn. <laughs> um, uh, but for me, it was, it was all of this stuff was sort of floating around in my head um, as kind of this umbrella idea that I would do all of my stuff under, but that's a hard thing to, to, um, uh, to write out in a mission statement. Um, so I just got to a point of, of really kind of saying, like, well, I don't, you know, honestly, I don't. I don't know. Like I wake up every day eager to do the work that I do. Um, I have a whiteboard of you know 50 other videos that I want to make um, that eventually you know I'll, I'll get to. And I'm every single time I enter that zone of being able to do that. Like if I have a light teaching day or something, and I can dedicate four hours to some part of you know developing a new video or or whatever it is, um, I know that I'm really really excited to do that. Um, 
in the same way that, that you know, we're, we're hopefully sometimes really excited to um, practice, you know, Scheherazade or, or Khan or, or whatever. Um, and so for me, that's enough. Uh, I, I hope that, again, by being true to who we are, everything that I put out or everything that these guys put out is um, sort of consistent within what that vision is, even if you can't articulate it. Um, I'm not someone who went, you know, I don't, I don't have any business school training. Um, I didn't do like a summer entrepreneurship course or anything. Um, so a lot of this is sometimes even hard to talk about because I don't know the right way to talk about it. Um, but, but I do know what gets me going every day. Um, and I think as long as stuff is moving in that direction, and as long as I continue to be really excited about it, um, I think, I hope that quality will be there and so that when I do put it out, when I do share it, it'll, it'll be effective. You guys may have to follow. Oh, I want to add something to that, actually. Because, um, it's, it's really fun. I'm part of this group on Facebook. It's called Australian YouTubers. And it's the equivalent of basically all these content creators around Australia. Some have a million subscribers, some have 10 subscribers. Like, it's a huge range of people. And there will always be the same post that's posted all the time that says, I really want to start making vlogs, but I don't know what to make them about. But I just want to make them. Like, what? I don't really know what I'm interested in, but I just want to make them. Right? Like, you don't, and like these people don't know what they're doing. Like they're, 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 they don't know why they don't want to make these videos. Right? They're like, give me some ideas. And I think that's what stops a lot of people from, you know, starting things like liquid drum and things like that. Is they are scared of taking the first step because they're afraid maybe they'll get judged or maybe it's not the right one. And because you were saying, I think your question said, um, what was, what's the mission last one? Mission. Yeah, your, your mission. Right? Like, how do you find your mission in creating this content? Because like everyone's directions are different and. For myself personally, I changed directions on my channels about 10, 15 times. I, I wanted to do comedy videos, didn't work out. I wanted to do day vlogs, didn't work out. I tried a lot of different things, but the fact is if you don't try, you will never find what it is that you want to look for. And if you if you try and you fail, at least you, you have something there. You know, it's still part of your portfolio. Whether you decide to unlist the video and take it off like because you're not happy with it or whatever, it's still something and you learn something from doing that. But the fact is a lot of people don't even get past that first step. So I encourage anyone who wants to try making content, whatever kind of content, be it Instagram, YouTube, whatever, just just make it. Just make it. And if anyone tells you that it sucks or whatever, like that's that should be motivation for you to keep going. Because as Drew was telling me in the car here from the airport, because I ran into the right accident <laughs> at the airport, he was saying that, you know, if someone is hating on you, it means you're doing something right because they're paying attention to your content and they're giving you feedback on it even though it's bad feedback. The fact that they even took the time to do that means you're doing something, right? You're doing something that is getting you noticed. So you can pick up from that, you can analyze it, you can say, what did I do that got me noticed? Oh, I used a clickbait title, I used a really obvious thumbnail or something, right? But the content sucked. Oh, look, hey. nemesis. <laughs> 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 right. Get out of there, get out of there. Get out of there. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so basically like, just take the first step in making your content and if it sucks, try again and just think, just analyze everything you make and figure out what you did right, what you did wrong and you will, you will just get better. Eventually you will automatically find what your mission is going yeah. I just, I just want it to be easier for, for you guys and I'll honestly like, it, it's, it's a big part of a lot of things. If, if people don't even know, I had this question in one of the clinics I did. I was just on this clinic tour and concert tour, but I mean, I was, I was, and someone's like, who do you, you know, who do you play for? And I get that question pretty frequently, actually, and I get it almost invariably all the time. We're like, hey, and I'm like, I don't really understand that question. You know, like, how deep are we going here? Because, like, you know, and they're like, no, I mean, like, do you play? They, they quantified it. Do you play for? Do you play for the audience? Do you play for yourself? Like, do you play for the band members on stage? And I was like. Man, I, I don't play for other music. Like, are you play for other musicians? Like, who's like who you? I don't really play for other musicians. Those guys are the first guys asking for free CDs and comp tickets. <laughs> Not playing for those guys. And those are the voices that usually scream the loudest. You know what I'm saying? And that's not always. I'm not saying all you guys ask for free CDs and free stuff or something like that. But in general, like, those are the, if anyone's asking me for comp tickets and stuff like that, it's the, my peers in the industry. And I get it. And no, I am mad at you. You know what I mean? I'm not saying I never asked for, you know, for those comp tickets either. But at the same time, that's kind of the, the relationship that we have. So you guys are not my intended audience because you're not feeding my children. You follow what I'm saying? So do I play for myself in the practice room? You know, but when, I'm, but when I play my instrument, I, I, want it, I want it to feel the same way 
I want you to feel something, and I want you to say, man, I like that. Like, if my albums are hopefully albums of good music, not vibraphone albums of good music. Like, I, I never want that. And I may do that, like, as some other project that whatever, just for my own set. But in general, like, when I listen to it, I want to listen, when I let people listen to it, like, man, this is bumping, this is cool, this is dope. You know, I don't want people to be like, whoa, you're vibraphone, I love what you did over the C minor seven, and when you transition to that, I, I, people start, I'm like, okay, thanks, man. <laughs> you know, like, I'm like, fail, scrap it, go back to the drawing board, you know what I mean? Because I just want it to be good music. And so that way, when people hear these things, or when they see these scary instruments, because a marimba, five octave marimba is a scary, hulking thing to people outside of this room, well, outside of this building, Okay, outside of this complex situation, <laughs> and this oil safety. Outside of all that, <laughs> it's a very scary instrument. And then a lot of times we play this scary music because we make it about us. We, we perform for ourselves so that this people in this room will say how great it is. And when we do that, we are further alienating the people who are going to come and pay tickets because we don't pay tickets to those clinics oftentimes. You know what I mean? Like so. That's not who I play for. So hopefully the goal, and, and then again, why is the name? It's not a xylophone, right? It, well, honestly, how am I gonna make it easier for people to wanna pay for this music and to wanna experience this music and embrace this music if you don't even know the names of the different instruments? You know what I mean? So that's also like an added thing to it. So at least it then benefits when someone else sees it like, oh, vibraphone, I like that instrument. You know what, I need that for my, are you in a wedding band? Are you in a thing? Whatever it is that you decide to do with it, or you decide to do with it, that it's like, oh, okay, yeah, I know that thing. Like, that's familiar because of the things that Weird Guides did on it, whatever. So for me, the, the why situation, a, a large part of it, I mean, we can go deep and talk about my children and stuff like that, but that's not, we're not, you know, but at the end of the day, like, even them, I want to make it easier for them that if they choose to do this really ridiculous thing that I've chosen to do, um, because I had no choice. I, I love it, I love it. Like, I have no choice. I tried to do it. I just, God, I tried to do, to do other things, and I, I can't. I can't do it. And so I can listen to a bunch of people who say, well, you don't have a degree. I, I, can, I, can, I can listen to a bunch of people who say, well, you don't, you shouldn't be, or you shouldn't be, or you shouldn't be. Or I can say, you know what? I love this thing. Like, I love that, that sound. I love it. You know what I mean? And like, really. And so I want to share that love with other people. You can't tell me I can't do that. You know what I'm saying? Like, imagine someone telling a guitar player, singer, songwriter, his name is, well, huh, you don't have a degree. You know what I'm saying? That's it. Why don't we just tailor? No. You know, I mean, it's silly because they love it and they share. And so, in all honesty, a large part of what drives me is I hope that by going through whatever little gauntlets that I have to go through to get content out, deal with a quote unquote hater, if they do exist, or do whatever, that when you guys decide to do it, or my kids even say, Dad, I love this thing, and I say, damn it. You know, and, and they decide to do it, that they can have an easier time, slightly easier time than, than I have. Else. Yeah. So I'm wondering for all of you guys, how much is your online presence, whether it's YouTube, Instagram, whatever, how much of that is actually contributing to your career directly? Are you making money off of the content that you create? Um, or do you consider it an important part of your career in other tangential ways? And then in addition to that question, which is actually more aimed at you than anybody else, is are you using things such as Patreon? to help support what you do, or is that a part of your revenue stream as well? And if so, how do you grasp that as a part of your overall package? Dang, I have a picture, I just haven't got into it yet. I'm one too so bad. I'll have a picture on the Yeah, you, you, I, I, I was asking yeah, yeah, the because you really got one there. But I feel like it's a big question about branding. Like in general, how important is a brand to someone than being hired or making money or doing a thing, you know, at the end of the day? Bye. I can say something about that. Because I have different tracks of what I'm doing on my um, online stuff, and different amounts of career are you know, involved. So you know, if you think about it, mechanically, what we're doing on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, is like what all the big percussion brands are also trying to do. They're just trying to send the traffic to their own products. And so to me, it's, it's important to um, I mean, I, I have educational courses, so it itself is a business. Um, but I also, uh, also like, in a, if you, um, you know, when I first started uh, putting stuff up, I was, I was, like, completely paralyzed with fear about other professionals and teachers and what they thought about what I was doing because it had never been done. I thought, you know. 
if I put a, uh, I don't know if you guys have experienced this, but like, I was like, if I put a, a recording of Delacruz up, are all the French percussionists on earth going to hate me? <laughs> <laughs> Turns out, only a few of them. <laughs> um, I don't want my students to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Um, and, no, but like, so when I first put out that, when I first put out this audition stuff, I was like, it, it would be like, I'd prepare it so like thoroughly and intensely, and then at the last second, I'd be like, and I'd have to get like support, like I'm friends on the phone, like do, do it, just do it. Boom. And like I remember um, uh, at, the, at the, like as soon as it would go out, I would like just wait, and I'd wait for, to see what would happen. And I would start hearing feedback from students, from you know people like in this room, from you know random people that I've never met, students at the University of Manitoba, and you know somebody in Northern Scotland, and like. But I didn't hear anything from teachers, and I remember like there was an email. Somebody somebody took an email I wrote that was like very honest and personal and forwarded it to like Chris Lamb and like Principal of Cleveland and like all these like pros and I was like, I can't believe they saw it. Like they definitely saw it and it's definitely been in their inbox. And for a while, it was silent. I didn't hear anything from professionals, from teachers, anywhere. It was almost like they didn't know what to say to me or they didn't know how to interpret it. They didn't understand it. And I thought I interpreted it immediately as they hate me. But what happened was their students started to tell them how much they liked it. And then I started getting calls to go teach at schools. And it became a part of my like, teaching career in that backwards way. Usually it would work like you know, I schmooze with Todd, who schmoozes with the teacher somewhere else, and like, oh, Rob, do you want to? But I, don't, I didn't have any of those schmoozing misses. <laughs> so um, so it, like, it, I, I feel like it's sort of like, in a bit, if you're uh, looking at it in a business way. This new way of education is B2C. You're talking directly to the consumer of the educational content. You're not trying, that's the big difference between the way we're teaching online and the way that you guys have all been taught is that we're teaching in order to impress the other teachers in the past. And now we're teaching for you guys and we're talking directly to you and saying, look, it doesn't work for you. I miss notes too, like, who cares, you know? Try this. Yeah, so, um, yeah, those are sort of two, two ways that it's built my career. I mean, I obviously, like, I have this kind of, I feel like I have an advantage. I have this, like, bass churning, like, along thing that I just have, like, I have to keep going to play opera, you know? And so I can, I can risk, I can do something weird and just, like, if it doesn't work, you know, who cares, um, you know? Yeah, so yeah, I don't have that thing. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, that's admittedly like that's a that's um there's a there's a safety net there. And you know, I I'm glad you say that because that I mean that that, that should be like if we're being honest, there are things um that you can do with that. Um you can you can be brave in ways that you might not otherwise. Um the flip side of that though, of course, is that like I, I don't have nearly as much time as I need in order to do all the things that I want to do for my step with Liquid Drum. So, um, to answer your question, like I'm Liquid Drum is a percussion company. So uh, that that is what it is. It's not just a, a fun thing. So um, yeah, all of my my social media stuff and my 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 video content. Um, is just in full disclosure meant to drive you to my store. Mm. It's got to make money, or else you can't justify right. the, to your family the daily, like or the IRS, or the <laughs> IRS. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, you know, Casey was saying this early uh, earlier the the kind of the slow burn aspect of it. Like yeah. I and I joked about this on a, on a video I did for 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 coming here. Like I I don't have much product at all. <laughs> Yeah, so like, I you know, I I get that like I can drive people to my store, but if they if they don't like my T-shirt, 
or they don't want to study tambourine or triangle, there's nothing for them. <laughs> but hopefully, you know, they can still say like, oh, well, let me go to the blog, and maybe there's, you know, there's some things of interest here. Then I can jump over to the YouTube or the channel. Um, but yeah, like I'm, I, it, it, it is a percussion company, and it is going to do things on into the future. Um, I'm not like trying to monetize video stuff at this point. Uh, I'm not doing like affiliate marketing or anything like that. Um, so in that way, I guess it's a bit more traditional. I'm just using all of this stuff for, for marketing. But and, then, and as a creative. But we're, we're friends because of this. You know what I mean? Like, I just did a clinic to the school because we're friends and hopefully I didn't do the service of the kids also on top of that. But I mean, but, but he can see my content. So for me, I don't have that safety net. Like I don't, I don't teach university. I teach lots of private lessons. Um, and I, I try to chronicle that um, because I feel like my journey is somewhat unique and I feel like there are a lot of, there's a, a strong segment of students who will not be in the orchestra and will not teach in a college and who don't want to teach in the, in the school, although they may do it for a while until they realize they don't want to teach in a school because of administration and testing, et cetera, et cetera. At which point they'll end up Cheesecake Factory until they end, anyway, I'll just, so in any case, but, but the point is, the point is, the point is that, but the point is that I feel like I represent a strong segment out there and I, and I think that it's important that they see that it is possible if you work really, you know, if you work hard and you do these types of things. I don't necessarily think about it in terms of how can I monetize this, although I do get lots of calls from it, I do get lots of people who reach out to me from it, but, but this, and this is important, there's also content there, like, and I was commenting on this with him, I said there's so many, someone, someone said to me, you know what I like is that you put your playing out there also, and I'm like, well, yeah, play, like, why would the playing not be out there? And, he's, and, he's like, and he said to me, yeah, I like that you put it out there with all the wrong notes. <laughs> it's but, but it's like, it's like, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, but who hasn't, who doesn't have wrong notes, man? I mean, and, and some of them are so over, like, you're like, oh man, I'll never be that, I'll never do that, like, no, man, I hit wrong notes all the time. Like, I play from a place, the hands are there, but I play from here, and when I, that's my phone. Um, and, 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 that, and that happens, so I mean, so, but as a result, though, I feel like the content needs to be there so that when they do see the body of work via online, that they can see, like, okay, he's competent. But I, I met him from this. I met him from, I, I met him and I'm meeting him, Casey, and I've been an admirer of Casey's work for so long. And I can't stress things, man. I don't love things. Um, um, I, can't, I cannot stress enough how important building real relations, even though it's online, you'll hear all the stigmas from all of our parents and whatever, that these things, oh man, get out, so whatever, but building real relationships and bridging that gap between them and finding a way to do that is very important aspect of a very important aspect of doing this, especially from a professional standpoint. You know, I mean, uh, yeah, I just feel like that is something that's sometimes missing. You're like, oh yeah, we're great friends. Really? Did you guys talk? Well, no. I can't, I'm going to give you a case in point right now. The girl sitting right there, Sarah James. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> She's my graphic designer. She designs every everything that you see. She is masterful. Yeah. <laughs> stuff for the, the clinic that we do. By the way, Mount Lab, June 11, South Florida. Go ahead and come through. All right. Um, all the stuff for the clinic that we do and everything like that. And I and what happened, I think she liked something and or commented on something. I went to her profile. It said graphic designer percussionist. I'm like, I need a graphic designer who understands what I do. I looked through her work. I went to her website. I reached out and I said, would you like to do it? And she's like, yeah, I'm interested. And then we began to converse and talk. And then now, like, it's actually the first time I'm meeting you. Yeah. Like I'm actually seeing, yeah. we were at Pacing yeah. together a lot. Like yeah. right now is the first time I'm actually physically meeting you. Yeah. But I feel, we talked on the phone a hundred times, she saved my ass so <clears throat> You know what I mean? Like she did my CD cover, like the whole, on the moment's notice. Like I feel like this is my sister right here. You know what I mean? And so, and I can't stress like how much, once you bridge that gap, that you're human and that you are connecting with people. And I think that's where the professional growth for me at least comes in. That's at least my way of having that story. I don't get paid for videos. Let's say I'm paid for videos. I want to touch on your monetization question. Yeah. This guy. A lot of people, like, especially when it comes to YouTube, a lot of people see like famous YouTubers like PewDiePie or whatever, and they say, oh, you can make one million dollars a year from making YouTube videos. Cool, I should make one. And they get disappointed when the ad revenue is one cent. You know, like, because CPM on YouTube is very low. Everyone knows that. AdSense revenue is very low. I don't get much from AdSense myself. Right? I average maybe about two, three K views a year, and I don't get that much revenue from it. So. That's, that's one thing, but then the second way is Patreon. Patreon, if you don't know, is a crowdfunding service where people pledge to you via regular donations. You can make it every week, every day, whatever you choose. 
And the most important thing to remember with all these monetization options is that you should ask yourself first, would you pay for that? Would you donate to this person? Would you pledge to this? If you, if you flip the roles around, would you pledge to it? Because I've seen some ridiculous crowdfunding pages that are percussion specific. One guy was trying to start a GoFundMe page to buy a Marimba One Izzy 5 octave Marimba. He asked for $20,000 US uh, in donations, and in return he would become a better musician. <laughs> that is a great deal. You should sign up on that right now, because the fact is that that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Because, like, why, why do people always think that? Because we're always given the idea that you know, these crowdfunding things are instantly gratifying, that you put your content up there, oh, everyone's going to pay for it, easy. I mean, he did it, like, like, but you have to offer a good value proposition to them. So these monetization things, when you start off, they will not be your primary source of income. That is just not the case. Like, too many people I know who I won't name have always started Patreon to, like, after making maybe one video or releasing one product and they say, donate to us, we promise we'll make more. You know, I started Patreon quite late in my videos, probably about 30 episodes in I started my Patreon. And even then, I had about three people pledging and they were pledging like $1 each. It wasn't much at all. But I, I made a promise, but I also had something to show for it. A lot of people don't have anything to show for it. So don't make any content with the idea of making money. You always have to, you always have to give a little bit of a chance and just do it without expecting to put food on the table through this, this one thing you've tried for like one day. It's just not, it's just not possible, right? So right now, like I have probably the most, like probably the, the least income of any of these guys because I get it from, you know, I teach part-time, I work with Rob, obviously. Um, I, I get these pledges from Patreon and I get a little bit of ad revenue. It's, it's not much at all, it's very, very little. Um, and this, this is the Patreon revenue, the ad revenue that pays for maybe my costs for producing the show. I don't get anything, so I still don't make a profit, but I'm happy to do it because it adds, as, I was, as Drew was saying, it's like a networking thing, it's a brand thing. Personal brand is very important nowadays because everyone who wants to like hire someone or work with someone, they look at their profile and they say, oh, this person has one picture of themselves with uh, a snapback that says straight out of content or something. <laughs> and they're not going to hire that person because they don't have anything to show for it. So it's more important that you produce with the intention of sharing and not the intention of making money because too many people on that same YouTube group that I was talking about, they were saying, oh Adam, I, d I just don't understand, like how come I'm not making more than a thousand dollars a month on my videos? I mean, I'm producing every day, I'm getting a thousand views, right? A thousand views should be a thousand dollars. Like it's just, it just makes sense. And then think about it from the advertiser's perspective. Would you really want to advertise on a cat video that is just a cat walking across the screen? Like, <laughs> would you want to advertise on that? Would you want to pay good money for that? No. So why should anyone pay for it? So that's what I will leave with the monetization. You always ask yourself, would someone else pay for that? And most of the time, nine, nine times out of ten, it's no. So you just, just roll with it until you have something good, attractive to offer for that. Person. And I have this conversation with, with Ivan a lot. Um, you know, and a lot of people actually who don't have kind of what we talked about, kind of like the, the safety net, the gig, right? We talk about the pie chart. The, the pie chart. You know, like all of our income is like a pie chart, you know, and, you know, and we look at that pie chart and say, okay, how much is coming from this X, Y, Z lessons or touring or, you know, Spotify streams or this or that or this or that. And that really makes up the, the job, you know, and when he, what, what he said that really struck me, which is really tiny, but he's like, I have a whiteboard with all of my stuff. The, when the flip happened from being social media, social media, cat pictures, selfies, well, okay, I did selfies. Um, you know, food pitch, okay, sometimes food, but on the other hand. And when it came from that to being like, okay, this is part of the job. Like, you know, okay, well, I have this post. Like, I have all of my posts are scheduled for, I have saved posts. Like, I take time in the evening. I just kind of review what's going to happen and when they're going to go out. And I put an alarm on my phone to remind me to hit the post button. Sometimes. This stuff, Instagram's a little different. I mean, Instagram. Pace is a little different because everything's happening right now, right? But I allow the space for that. Most of that stuff ends up on the story. The stuff that is curated that goes out, be, it's a business. It's not that like I, my wife had to realize that because she's kind of like, hey, you know, it's we're friends. You know, she's out with her friends. She's taking pictures of food and things like that. But I don't think about social media that way anymore. I don't think about any of it that way. Okay, if I share it here, I look at the analytics. When's the high time? When should I share the, the meat post? You know, did I share too much of that? Words don't get shared on Instagram. You know what I mean? If I post a flyer with words on it, it'll get squashed. If I try to promote that, it'll get maybe a third of what it would otherwise. Like these are the things that I think about. So I have some word flyers on here now because there's specified people, but those will get archived real soon. So I don't want you seeing 30 likes on a picture when I have. You know what I'm saying? Because you oh, well, I guess those followers are all bought. And I mean, those Afghani followers are on Drew's you know, Facebook or whatever page. 
So I mean, when he said the whiteboard thing, that was the immediate thing is like uh, to business. And so I feel like it, it's, it's just another part of that, that pie or it, it leads to that pie. And all of the things are taking you to the same, hopefully enforcing the same brand. They're all just roots of the same brand. You know what I mean? Like they, none of them go the other direction. Um, and, and just this the last thing that I'm talking too much for sure, right? Because um, I need to hear more from. <laughs> um, I was sitting. This all happened for me. I was sitting at a bar, and this guy walks into a bar, and um, <laughs> seriously sits down. And I, you know, we got this conversation. He goes, uh, you know, what do you do? He's like, I'm a social media consultant. I was like, yeah, whatever, buddy. Like social media consultant. Like, Get a real job. I know. I feel like that. Um, and so and so, I'm like, hey, what do you think of mine? Like, after a conversation, he's like, he looks at. He goes, I can't tell what you do. Like he literally looked at it like this one, can't tell what you do. I'm like, what do you mean you can't tell what I do? Like it's not a xylophone, right? And he's like, yeah, but there's a picture of this pretty girl a couple times, good makeup, and a makeup vlog, like I'm looking at it. You got some pictures of the kids, is it a fatherhood thing? Like what, what, what do you do? And I looked at it and I was like, okay, I got it. So I had to split it up and I had to create something else to be very direct and pointed. And when he said that, it kind of like really hit me. And a lot of people who I, would love to follow, except for I don't know them, and all their pictures are of them, their cat, and their girlfriend. Um, it's like I'm not interested in any of this stuff. Like if you drum all the time, like I'll follow that. I want to see I want to see drumming all the. You know what I mean? That's why we. That's the connection we have. But if you if you're trying to be a drummer or you're trying to be a percussionist and that's what you do, then that's then I, you know I can't if I can't tell like I'm not really all about the the, the give and take. You know what I mean? So it's, it's kind of an important thing to see it as a job in that way. Any other questions, I guess? Casey. Last, last question? Last question. Yeah. yeah, all right. Last yeah. So, it's kind of directed at all of you. How much time do you find yourself spending like creating, managing your content? And on top of that, how, is, how do you balance that with like everything else you do in your job? Yeah. I don't have job. <laughs> or whether else you need. <laughs> I mean, it's a lot easier nowadays because we all have phones and stuff to manage this stuff on the fly. Like a lot of the time, um, so for me, I will spend maybe about eight to ten hours editing each episode um, because I like to be really picky with my editing. I'm super picky. Like I always want to have this cut maybe like one frame earlier, one frame later. So it will take me a while to do that. But that's not the only part, obviously. It's like obviously the filming process, and some of my videos are more elaborate. They might take five to seven hours each. And I'll dedicate like a day to film and a day to edit. And then like, because if you do it all in one chunk, you, you will just burn out your life. Like sometimes if you leave it down between, you have new ideas and you might emerge with a better vision than what you started with. And then the rest of the time during the week, I'll spend maybe about 15 to 30 minutes each day going through the networks, like liking posts, sharing things, keeping the thing fresh. It's like watering a plant repeatedly because it keeps dying on you. Like, just water, 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 water. Oh, I'll put another one. Water, 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 water. <laughs> just keep going. So it doesn't, it's, it's something that you do have to take care of. It is something that you have to dedicate time to, but it's not difficult if you just give it a plan and you keep using your phone to update as you go. Like maybe you're sitting at the bus stop, give a like to this guy, comment on this post, post something completely irrelevant. Like, that's all part of the thing. So yeah, not, not, not too bad. It's the same as practicing. Yeah. There's never enough time for it, so you have to work on scheduling it in and becoming more efficient at it, and it's the same exact project. It's just different activities. Mm -hmm. that was, yeah, I think. <laughs> <laughs> we all can speak in percussion language, so mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Maybe we do one more. Deal. Yeah. Let's okay. One, one more. more. Yeah. It doesn't feel. Got to be profound though. Like, yeah. It's gotta be right. Wait, hold on. Have all of you followed? Have you followed all of us? There's no questions. Yes. You have followed. Okay, cool. Yeah. Just making sure you've all. All right. So, do you feel? I just looked at uh, right next to me here, and I'm thinking, do you feel that there's a shift? Because your this presentation, this panel is exactly what I did in a PD session earlier in the year in my school. There's a guy named George Koros, who's a former school administrator, who's gone around talking about relationships and online content, and he made a comment that has stuck with me, and I think it could apply here. Was that People will use Yelp or TripAdvisor to Google the restaurant that they're going to go to or to look up the restaurant, but they will not look up the teacher or the person who's producing the content or the place that they're going to drop their kids off to or whatever. We do more research. We post more pictures of our food 
than so many other things. Do you sense a shift within the percussion community because you said, oh God, what if this teacher sees this or who's gonna look at this content? We were in a committee meeting earlier and we sensed a shift from, it's not about the top guys and the activity. It's not about the guy who has his name on every stick and mallet. It's about us as percussionists reaching out and being musicians and spreading the good news. Do you sense that shift being in general, like say for instance, you with your position with the Met or the university thing, or you know, you straddle, you know, the pop and the drum line scene, or you're doing the college thing, like do you sense a larger shift, a larger change in this because of what you're doing? Are you seeing something? Is there something that you would you know what I mean? I think I know what you mean. I, I think it's a, a reoccurrence of an older thing, which is, like you said, word of mouth is still the best way to advertise things. For, for instance, this is, I made a funny video a while ago with my friend Pius Chang, and I did a mallet comparison video, and I like, did mine, then mine sounded great, and then Pius says I like overlaid fart sounds on all of his. And I thought, oh, this is funny, this is gonna be fun to do. I'm not selling anything behind it other than like maybe showing my audience I'm fun or something. But uh, yes, a lot of people, the video starts very serious. Like, hey guys, Case Kindles are here. I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about uh, this mallet series and I hope it's real educational for you. I, no editing was made whatsoever, like setting up the joke. But there isn't anything funny for a little while. So word of mouth, the people, the few people who are like, oh, I do actually want to see a mallet comparison video. <laughs> and, and they endured the first you know, 30 seconds or whatever. And then they were so happy to see the joke. And like my clarinet professor at JMU, he saw it. He, he, he said, uh, Casey, you know, I had no idea this video was, uh, I, I saw it at first, I thought mallet comparison, I'm not interested in this, and I turned it off. And then I got an email from a student that said, no, you have to watch this. So you have to watch this. So word of mouth, yeah, is really, really, I think, very, very strong still. And if anything, the shift might be just the dilution of the online stuff. It's, it's harder to stand out. You know, I mean, at, like if we all had to produce videos as well as Adams, it, it would be really We'd hire Adam. hard. Yeah, like that's like, like, I, said, like I said, but like I said before, that's just like so much freaking work. Like that is so much work, and you have to know what you're doing. And being someone who's gotten just marginally better at making their own videos and recording, I mean, it's a totally other skill set. And then on top of that, you're supposed to like play good. <laughs> it's, it's no wonder that there aren't tons of that out there. And, and, and to clarify that even more, I mean, I, I, and this will help, is now that you find that there's no longer the gatekeepers to information, like you said, you said, go to that teacher. If you didn't know, like prior to me getting to the city to study with the principal percussionist in town, I didn't know. Prior to me going to drum corps, you didn't know how well, to play. Well, man, look at this. Look at this. Look at this panel. Right. This isn't even on the schedule. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's packed. You know what I mean? Or at least it was before we board people. Whatever. But I mean, <laughs> I mean, but it's 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 packed. And I, it's funny. Like he, he keeps saying, I can't believe this is actually happening. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, the schedule. We talked about it earlier, like, hey, this thing is not as big, but it's really big over there, like the difference between the PAS marching thing and WGI. Like, all of a sudden, but, but the way WGI and WGI groups market themselves and the way they share things is so completely different than the traditional yeah. pathway. So, so yeah, you said it's word of mouth, but yeah, it's I mean, different. But it, there's definitely a shift to answer the question, because, I mean, I still walk past people, hey, can I get a picture? And I walk right past them. Like, Oh, you're talking to me? Mm -hmm. Like, I, okay, yeah, sure. You know, I mean, straight up, like I don't, it doesn't, it doesn't register to me too, and it also doesn't register to me too because I, I focus on the, and I mean, these, I, I try to be as sincere as possible, but I think about all that stuff as a brand, but like the me who wants to hang out and have a beer, you know, I have to, you know, you know what I mean? Like it's not the same, so, I, you know what I mean? Like, I just want to just take a screenshot of the Instagram thing or whatever. I mean, but I just can't believe that, I can't believe that, just by doing, being consistent and being honest and putting out some quality content or as quality as I think I can put out, that people actually, ha it has added actual value. Is that, you know what I mean? Like it's still kind of surreal, so it must be a shift because otherwise, 
you know, it's, uh, I don't see, you know, you got, you got Mark Ford doing stories now. I never thought I'd see a golf. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's just like, wow. It's, it seems like cool. the internet has affected us just like the rest of all marketing. You know, you go on Facebook and there's all sorts of you know, things that you only saw commercials for on TV. You see everywhere now, too. And they're doing YouTube ads and they're doing, yeah, so the, I would say the shift is uh, the same for us as it is for, for everyone else. So yeah, the kiddos who they hear about your school through an online video or something, they might have no clue who the teacher is there, but they saw the video or whatever. And I think that's just the, the whole internet marketing thing seeping into this world too. Yeah. I have one last question. Um, do you guys get nerdy about like the website traffic and stuff and like the attention span of your viewers and stuff? Like, are you, are you like conscious of like he how tells me I should. <laughs> He sends me a, a, what do you call that, a report of all the analytics, and I just look at it and I'm like, oh, so do you think I should like ask them to comment more? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's important. I mean, yeah. you don't have to get really into the nuts and bolts of it, but important thing, the most important thing is average watch time on YouTube, because it doesn't matter how many views you're getting if they're watching 10 seconds. Right? Doesn't matter. Average watch time should be at least like 40% of the video, because if it's not, you're just talking a lot of crap and no one cares. Okay, mm -hmm. this, that's the first thing. The second thing is probably the, um, the, the demographics. Demographics is important because you want to know who you're catering to. So for my audience, is predominantly under the age of 21, which is why I use the word lit way too much. Which is, <laughs> which is why I do this all the time. Because if I did that to people who were 65 years old, they'd probably block my channel and flag it as spam. So <laughs> that's, that's, it's important to know those two, I reckon, is, is the most important. Because one tells you that you need to work, one tells you that you're irrelevant. Right? So you need to know those two. All the other things, like um, how many people are commenting and stuff, that's all relative. But as long as you're putting call to actions, which is basically, you telling people, oh yeah, that's that's another thing actually, call to actions, because I told Rob about this early on in our relationship, I was like, you have to tell people to like the video, you have to tell people to comment the video, you have to tell people to hit the subscribe button, why? Because there's this automatic assumption that everyone knows how to use YouTube really well. Everyone assumes, oh yes, the subscribe button, I mean, like that's obvious, it's right there, but you'd be surprised how many people don't know what subscribe means, they don't know what thumbs up means, but all these things, drive traffic to your channel, and all it takes is you saying it. Because when someone thumbs up your video, it appears in the newsfeed. It appears in the um, Twitter notifications of some people. That's instant reach in like five seconds, just by clicking the thumbs up. What about the subscribe button? When they click the subscribe button, notifications get sent to their email. That's, that's like instant notification, instant views every time you upload something. This is all stuff that you can do just by saying it in the video. Because not everyone is YouTube savvy, not everyone is Facebook savvy. But when someone tells you to do something, chances are you will just do it. It's just subconscious. That's the, that's the idea of YouTube, is that you listen to the person watching it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so call to actions, viewer retention, demographic, and don't worry about things like camera quality or like uploading in 4K, no one cares about 4K. Like hardly anything can handle 4K. We upload in 1080p because we are scrubs and we can't afford better gear. Okay, we Rob still shoots on that thing, that thing isn't that expensive. I still shoot on that thing, that thing's not expensive. Um, you don't need to shoot on like red cameras or anything. I saw some crazy camera rigs here. I was like, do you guys upload this anywhere? Or does it get archived in some <laughs> back room in the middle of nowhere? Right? It's what you do with the content back then. It's not what you should do. Yeah. Sorry. I was <laughs> in a way, the, the analytics are interesting to look at because if you are at a school and you have a recital and a bunch of your friends come, but you don't know how interested they were, you know? You don't know if they got bored immediately and, yeah. started, you know, and clicked 25 Instagram picture likes while they, you were doing your recital. Like, you just kind of do it and you have no idea what the reaction is. I used to like obsess over website views and then, then I obsessed over YouTube views and, and then Adam told me to, some other things I should obsess over. And, and then I was, setting the whole thing up as a business and I started obsessing over like income and then I got the best analytic that I think I ever got. This year, I, so I teach about auditions online and this year three people who I taught won auditions. And to me that was the impact that I realized nothing else mattered at all compared to that result. I feel like uh, if you can, I think for me after having obsessed with like a bunch of different random analytics, if you can think of like, connecting, you asked about mission before, right? If you can connect 
your goal with the analytic that describes your goal, you know? It went, maybe that's to make your music sound so interestingly phrased that it's just absolutely beautiful. Then your analytic isn't gonna be how many people start your video or how many people uh, watch for 10, it's gonna be how many people stay till the end. And you can use that as a feedback loop to experiment with different kinds of phrasing. You know what I mean? Um, so I think it's a tool, analytics are a tool. All right, All right. cool. Thank you guys so much for coming.